Well, Joe Amato just had his hands full with Frank Bradley, a 5.37 for you, a 5.39 for him. It was a close race, Steve. What was the speed? The speed, well, I, it wasn't 280, if that's what you want to know. It was about 273, but it looked like it hurt itself before it could get that big mile an hour. Now, yeah, it felt like it died a little bit about the 1,000-foot mark, you know, but you know, we're in the second round here. We're, we'd like to get the speed record, but we'd also like to win the race, and we're in the hunt for the world championship, so, you know, you can't look ahead and try and just go for the speed record. You've got to try and win the race and stay even with LaHaye as far as the points chase goes here. Indeed. See you in the semifinal round. Thank you. So Joe Amato and crew head back to go to work on their machine as he continues his march toward yet another world championship and possibly his first U.S. Nationals title. That brings up in second round, Daryl Gwen as he faces Bill Mullins. And Daryl Gwen, Paul, still cannot be counted out as a potential world champion. He's won two events this year, has some tremendous horsepower in the longest wheelbase car in all of drag racing. But in qualifying, Daryl had some problems. Watch the car in the near lane. A malfunction somewhere in the engine caused the supercharger to explode violently. A lot of fire, but Daryl was okay. Fortunately, all of the safety systems worked. As we take a look at it from a back angle, Gwen's engine let go. Then Steve talked with him at the far end. Well, as you can see, a tremendous blower explosion here. All the safety straps have done their job. Most of the parts still remain on the engine, except one errant piece somehow punctured the right rear tire. So, Daryl Gwen, uh, did you have any control problems, or did it maintain pressure to you get it stopped? No, I don't think it became flat till pretty close around here, around the corner. But... Uh... An, an explosion like that, the number one thing is you want to try and get the shootout right away. And that was the main objective was um, get the car slowed down because the run ain't over till you're around here and stopped and out of the car and safe. And that's the main thing I was trying to do is get around this corner. Your, your temperament about things like this has changed considerably in the last couple of years. A blower explosion before just decimated you emotionally. Well, it did, but uh, now with a little backing from Budweiser and Quaker State, these things... An I'll attitude be, adjustment maybe somewhere along Yeah, and an attitude adjustment from Dale Armstrong. I think this will... Uh, Things like this happen, and um, you just got to make the best of them. So Daryl Gwen saved himself, saved the car, and now faces this man, Bill Mullins. This is second round action, top fuel eliminator. Bill is out of Pelham, Alabama, and experimenting with a unique combination. It's high gear only in that car, no transmission to shift. Now, earlier in the first round, he met up with this man, Gary Ormsby, Roseville, California, the number one qualifier. Now, here, let's look back at that race. In the far lane was Ormsby, in the near lane was Bill Mullins. Mullins was taking his time staging. You can see Ormsby's front wheels are already positioned and were for some time. He continued to build heat, and that possibly caused him to have too much horsepower. He smoked the tires. What an upset in round number one. Don talked with it. One of the problems of having the fastest and quickest car at the event is... Uh, you have so much horsepower, sometimes hard to deal with on that first round, isn't it? It's real hard, and it's right on the edge, as you well know, and it can, it's a fine line there between getting down that racetrack and smoking the tires. Well, we'd like to congratulate you on being the number one qualifier and uh, wish you the best at the next race. Okay, thanks, Don. So that action set up this confrontation between Mullins in the far lane and Gwen in the near lane. Don Garlitz, what do you think? Well, I think that uh, Daryl Gwynn is really thinking about trying to get this national event under his belt. He needs this win and those bonus points to uh, contest this world championship. They both come off the line even. Gwynn rips over toward that center line. And coming to the finish, it is Daryl Gwynn with a 5.32.75 to a losing 5.57.262 for Bill Mullins. And that brings up Shirley Muldowney. She will face Michael Brotherton. And Shirley has lane choice. She's chosen the far lane. Now, she got that choice by the previous round elimination. The driver that turns the quickest time in the previous round will get the lane choice. Let's go to the far end. Steve is with Daryl Gwen. Well, that was Daryl Gwen's best performance of the entire weekend, a 5.30. But you had to drive it. It got loose in the middle, moved mm. around. Yeah, it did. Actually, today, this car is an animal. We've been trying to find the power all weekend long. And... Uh... Thanks to all the hard work and crew last night. Uh, we worked our tails off to about 2 o'clock in the morning here. We heard a motor here late yesterday. And, uh, boy, the car's really coming around. Just hope we got lane choice for next round. So Shirley Muldowney is ready now to face Michael Brotherton. Shirley ran the best run of her career, a 5.28 in round number one. She also qualified with a 5.28. The three-time world champion has a lot of confidence today. But first, she has to get by this man, and he gets tougher with every race. 
a first-year rookie, Michael Brotherton out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Brotherton beat Gene Snow to get to this round of eliminations. Don Garlitz, here's a rookie in the biggest drag race in the world. That's got to be tremendous pressure. Oh, it is, uh, Paul. Tremendous pressure on uh, the driver and the crew. You just wonder how they make the right decisions to uh, keep that thing in one piece. And, of course, he's facing a tremendous name on the far side, Shirley Muldowney. As they come off the line, Muldowney gets ahead, coming away from the starting line, and continues the lead all the way to the finish. Shirley Muldowney with a 542.77 to Michael Brotherton's losing 555.266. And a bit of fire at the back of Brotherton's car. Nothing to be concerned with, Paul. A minor oil fire, it has extinguished itself, and I'll try to get a word with Shirley as soon as she's out of the car. Back at the starting line, second round action continues. Kim LaHaye, crew chief for her father, Dick LaHaye, is working on the engine there, and this does not appear to be normal, Don Garlis. Uh, they're having a little bit of a problem there with a the starter. That's the starter wire they're trying to put together. They're holding it together with their bare hands to get that engine started. So some quick thinking and brave moves by both Kim and Jeff LaHaye in this family affair that is the LaHaye team. In second round, Dick LaHaye will face Eddie Hill, world championship boat racer. He's still looking for his first nationals title, and he would love to have it happen here at the most prestigious event in drag racing, the U.S. Nationals. And Dick LaHaye, of course, is locked in battle with Joe Amato fighting for the world championship. Let's go to the far end and Steve. Well, I'm standing with a lady who just recorded a career best top speed at 277 miles per hour. It's fast. <laughs> Would have liked a little better ET. A it's five four zero. Well, it shook on me out there, but it's clean and nice, and we we know what to do. You can go back to that 528 from the first round. Yeah, we get to yeah 28, and that may I think two more 28s might do it. <laughs> get to race my friend Joe. That's right, Shirley Mulally and Joe Amato side by side. And that will make for one terrific matchup. Ursie Hill helps her husband, Eddie, back his machine into place at the starting line, putting those rear wheels in just the right position for a launch. Eddie Hill, motorcycle dealer out of Wichita Falls, Texas. He faces Dick LaHaye, the quickest man in the sport with a 517 earlier in the season and three Nationals victories so far this year. So it's LaHaye on the near side. On the far side is the Texan Eddie Hill as the Texan inches up through the staging lights and is ready for his run against Dick LaHaye. LaHaye watches very carefully from the near side. And Paul, every time you see Dick LaHaye, he's wearing a big smile because he is enjoying his greatest ever season in drag racing. LaHaye near lane, Eddie Hill far lane, the staging is complete. Green lights flash and they're away right together. No man had an advantage off the bar, but it's Dick LaHaye by a clean car lane. 5.3027 miles per hour, Eddie Hill at 5.40. And that sets up maybe the greatest semifinals ever. It will be Dick LaHaye gunning for that world championship up against Daryl Gwynn. Lane choice to Gwynn, and that could be important. And Shirley Muldowney, she could be the spoiler in this whole thing. As she meets Joe Amato, Amato will be able to pick his lane. Now, Amato had a little engine trouble in this round, and there's his crew back in the pit area. They're checking the bearings on the bottom there, and there's Tim Richards, the famed crew chief, reassembling the engine, putting the supercharger manifold back on it. So apparently, uh, they have fixed whatever was wrong inside. We'll be back with more drag racing from the U.S. Nationals. We're back at Indianapolis Raceway Park, where the crew is putting the finishing touches on Shirley Muldowney's pink dragster for the Top Fuel semifinals. I'm Steve Evans, along with Paul Page and Big Daddy Don Garlitz. And Paul, we are ready for the second round of Funny Car Competition. And what a pair it is, the defending champion, Mike Dunn from California, who earlier recorded that 278 mile per hour track record. He needs to run within 1% of that today to back it up for an official national record. And he's up against, well, what can you say? Don the Snake Perdome has won here six times, three in Top Fuel, three in Funny Car. He took last season off, but has come back with a vengeance already this year, having won the Motocraft Gator Nationals down in Florida. And Mike Dunn, of course, with the roof hatch up to let whatever fresh air he can get into that cockpit. Now, Mike Dunn, who won here a year ago, he's a machinist by trade. His car owner elects to run the car only a few times a year. Don the Snake for Don, well, he's in the full pull, running all 14 NHRA national events and hopes to get one more win before this season is over. And Don Garlitz, earlier in the day, you spent some time with Perdome helping him out, really. Yeah, the snake has been having a lot of trouble getting off the line here. He's uh, constantly been spinning the tires. In fact, he qualified 16th at this event. Very unusual for the snake. 
Well, he's made it to the second round, Don. What kind of things did you tell him? Well, I told him, uh, you know, we're running tremendous high gears in these cars today, which is evidenced by the uh, high speeds that these cars have been turning. And the uh, Snake put a couple of those high gears in his car, and it's uh, helped him considerably. Is he going to give you a piece of the action when it's over? Well, I sure hope so. I hope he uh, does well. You know, the Snake and I have been friends for a number of years. Well, the snake we see here has been having problems smoking the tires. Not so Mike Dunn. In fact, his car runs slower off the starting line than just about any other. And they're away. Don Riddell moves his traction. A little smoke out of Mike Dunn's car, but look at Dunn run on the other end. Mike Dunn goes to the semis. What a rather slow last time. A 597, 261 miles per hour. He got a big break when Don Prudhomme smoked the tires. Now watch Prudhomme on the far side. Immediately, as he comes off the line, those tires begin to spin. Then the telltale blue smoke that says traction is gone. Mike Dunn roars on to a victory and into the semifinals. Well, any time the world's fastest funny car driver, Mike Dunn, slows down into the 260 mile an hour range, something went wrong. What, Mike? Oh, I got a little loose out there. Uh, I don't know if the trash going away. It was so soft the first run, we decided to step on it a little bit in the second run. And, and it got a little loose out there, so I didn't drive. You know, I don't drive out the back door if it spins a tire. We don't care about mile an hour then. So the smoke we saw was not from the engine, but from the tires. Yeah, and out in the middle, just it started to spin the tires, and I locked the clutch up, and she started spinning pretty good. So we'll have to make an adjustment for that for next round. My final's coming up. Thank you. So as he goes to semifinals, Mike Dunn will have to find a better balance between clutch and engine to keep those tires from spinning. We continue with action now. Second round, and there is the king, Kenny Bernstein. And what a season this man has enjoyed. He has won six NHRA National Championship events. That's a huge lead for the World Championship. In fact, only needs one more win to tie Don Prudhomme for the all-time record of the most wins in one season at seven. The U.S. Nationals pays more points than any other race, so Kenny Bernstein of Newport Beach, California, could virtually clinch his third World Championship. Not to stop him, well, that's Ed the Ace McCullough. Him in California, he's won the U.S. Nationals three times, the first back in 1971. While shaking his head is the famed crew chief for Kenny Bernstein, Dale Armstrong. He's been doing that a lot this weekend. It has not gone flawlessly for that car. In fact, they do not have quick time at this event. That honor goes to Mark Oswald in round number one. He defeated Jim Head with a 546. So Bernstein, well, he's not backed into a corner, but he's not dominant either. Off the mark together, Ed McCullough with the wheels in the air. And McCullough's engine blows. Kenny Bernstein wins it with a very nice 556. He went to 65 miles per hour. Big problems for Ed the Ace McCullough and the racetrack. When that engine let go, it dumped 14 quarts of 70 weight oil in the far lane. So we've got a massive cleanup, Don Garlitz, and some concern. You bet. And the uh, NHRA, as good as they do it, uh, it's the best in the business. It still is concerning for the driver because they've got to drive down this track where all this oil has been deposited. And uh, I'll tell you, it puts a lot of pressure on you. We look at this run again. Bernstein on the near side, Ed McCulloch on the far side. You see the tires spun a little bit. He then pulled back on the throttle. When he did that, the engine leaned out and the engine let go. So the fire lights up, very quickly extinguished by the onboard fire system. No problems personally for him. He is safe as you see him there taking his fire suit off. But obviously, they've got a lot of work to do to get the engine back in shape. Let's go to the far end and Don. Tell me, uh, does that uh, 546, uh, do you concern yourself with that, or you just go on your own deal and kind of tunnel vision and don't don't look at the other competitors? Well, I wish you could tunnel vision it, but it's awful hard to not think about a 546 by your competitors. But we started to work on it this round to maybe step it up a little bit and go after it a little harder so that if we get fortunate enough to make it to the finals and Mark gets there, then we'll be ready for him. We can't wait till the finals and step on it. You know that. It'll be over with. You've done a real good job today with getting this car nailed down in the center. Uh, that was what was plaguing you before, keeping that drive shaft speed down. Uh, Dale is evidently getting that worked on. Absolutely. The starting line's great. It leaves uh, good there. In fact, we're soft on the starting line. We needed more. But like you said, in the middle of the racetrack, 150, 200 off the line, it was tough to get it hooked up. But maybe now we've got it going. Dale's certainly working at it. Well, we wish you the best, Kenny. Great. Thank you. Well, Kenny is always giving Dale Armstrong all the credit. Armstrong will tell you that Kenny's driving this year has been a big part of their success. And here in the pit area, talking about success, there's Kim LaHaye, who has wrenched her father's top field racer to three wins this year, and she hopes for her first ever U.S. Nationals. We'll be back. 
Indianapolis Raceway Park, the U.S. Nationals, the 33rd edition. Over 125,000 people have been out to Raceway Park over the week long of activities, and this is the final day. This determines the champions. In Funny Car, John Force now is set to take on Mark Oswald. And this has been John Force's greatest year out of a dozen seasons he's been competing. And a lot of that credit, he'll tell you, has to go to Austin Foyle, his crew chief, the man who formerly ran the famed Chi Town Hustler car. The body being latched down on Mark Oswald's machine, that is a fiberglass replica of a Ford Thunderbird. Let's remember now, Oswald is the quickest car here at the U.S. Nationals in the funny car category with that 5.46. Leonard Hughes, the crew chief on this machine. Oswald now glides out of the water and squeezes into that throttle. They do the burnout in high gear, then he'll back up and has to remember to put it back into low gear. Now, this is a rematch of the final round of yesterday's Big Bud shootout. It featured Mark Oswald up against John Ford. Eight cars started in that particular competition when it got down to the final two. In fact, let's go back to yesterday and take a look at that final round. In the near lane, as he will be today, was Mark Oswald. In the far lane is John Ford. Now, Oswald was off the mark first. Oswald, when hooked up, appeared to have it in hand until he lost traction. A water line broke, put some water under the rear tires. John Ford collected 50000 dollars for five seconds work his biggest payday ever i talked to him so you were beating the final last year everybody knew how badly you wanted and you've done it john you've done it for your crew for yourself my sponsors my crew my wife austin coil baddest person i know and all them people up there i love all of you and they love you got no words here man I understand. John Force has been waiting so long for this. An earlier national event went in Montreal, Canada. was not televised. Many of his fans were unable to see it. And here is the crew for John Force. The biggest payday in this man's professional drag racing career. Which started on the drag strips of Australia and New Zealand. It was the only place he could get paid to race. No longer. But now, 24 hours later, this is the rematch, and it's for the title of U.S. Nationals Funny Car Eliminator. Now, Don Garlitz, John Forrest has an extra challenge. That is the lane that was oiled so badly earlier. Yes, he does, and uh, it was a massive oil down, as uh, Steve quoted, uh, 14 quarts. And now John has got to be thinking about that. He makes a good run through it, no smoke off the tires, but Mark Oswald moves ahead. Reverse of yesterday as Oswald comes through with a 555, 260 miles an hour to forces losing 568, 258 miles an hour. So Mark Oswald reverses the situation of the Big Butt shootout and moves ahead in funny car eliminations. Here is Eric Reed in the far lane as he is ready to take on Johnny West. Now this is one of those classic confrontations between a brand new driver in Eric Reed and a longtime veteran in Johnny West. Down at the far end now, Steve is with Mark Oswald. Right now, Mark Oswald is far more concerned with wind lights than he is the times it takes to get them. But that was a 555. Yeah, we're pretty happy with that. You know, the heat of the day, it's hard to run like that. That deal this morning, you know, was just an excellent run. Everything worked right. We're just happy to stay consistent and try to put the Thunderbird in the winter circle. That's got a little hotter, a little more humid. That that doesn't hurt. doesn't help, brother. No, it doesn't. You know, we're happy with that. You know, we're keeping pace with Kenny and everybody like that. So things are looking good. If we can keep things from falling off of it. See you in a little while. Thank you. Okay, right now, Don Garlitz is with John Forrest. Well, that's kind of a heartbreaking way to go. But uh, I think you made one heck of a run through that lane. Yeah, she was slick and Cole made a few changes up there and uh, it showed we were happy that the performance come back and the car came back and ran 60s again and, and uh, we were content with that. You bet a 568 with a massive oil down that that was speaks highly of your driving, John, and the NHRA's cleanup crew. It was slick and as far as, uh, you know, we got down, we're going on to win this race. Uh, you know, there was uh, big money here, but we got it yesterday, and maybe Oswald, he's a heck of a competitor to that team, and uh, maybe he'll get it today, and uh, don't matter, my bank wouldn't have taken that much money anyway. Well, if his bank won't, mine will. I'll be happy to take it for him.
And once again, as we look at Johnny West on the line, we're looking at the combination of years of experience versus youth and enthusiasm. It's been a tough year for Johnny West in Chandler, Arizona. He's made two final rounds only to lose them both. Now, for Eric Reed, it's been a very exciting year. He went to Frank Holly's drag racing school, started his career. He's already got one win light. His first one ever came here this weekend, but what a perfect place to get it, Don Garlick. You bet. Imagine that. His first time out, and he beats Billy Meyer, one of the veterans of drag racing. He's got to be excited right about now. Hope it's not too exciting. What do you mean? Well, he's got to leave perfect on time, not red light, not be late, not spin the tires through that oil, not step on it too hard. I mean, he's got a lot on his mind, and he's thinking about that earlier win. And he does a good job until he loses traction. The car almost gets into the wall. Eric Reed manages to maintain control, rolling Leon, passive as ever, watches Johnny West, his driver, take the win at a 575, 255 miles per hour. And that will set the funny car semi-final pairing. With Lane Choice, it will be Kenny Bernstein when he faces Johnny West. Also with Lane Choice will be Mark Oswald. Oswald will be up against Mike Dunn, the defending U.S. national champion in the Funny Car Semifinal. So with the Funny Car Semi set, we continue with action at the 33rd U.S. National. Round number two of Pro Stock, Daryl Alderman, ready to take on Kenny Delco. The pro stock car is often called the factory hot rods because rules require them to maintain a stock body shape. But they're very sophisticated, 500 cubic inch engines, two four-barrel carburetors, minimum weight of 2,350 pounds. And here is a driver that's getting everybody's attention, Harold Alderman from Fairfield, Illinois. He has been cutting some beautiful light, and he'll need one when he faces Kenny Delco, Delco from Center Reach, New York. And you know, the entire pro stock field will qualify within a tenth of a second, so the entire race is based upon reaction times. You've got to have a good one in this class. RPM's up to about 8,000, and they're off the mark. This is a beautiful race. Daryl Alderman in the far lane. Kenny Delco in the near lane. It is Alderman. Daryl Alderman, 7.59, and he beats a quicker 7.57 by Kenny Delco. That is the classic example of what the fans and the drivers call the whole shot, Paul. Watch the far lane. Alderman moves even before Delco has even thought about it. And it is that move alone that carries him all the way to the end of the quarter mile in the lead. The whole shot definitely making the difference here. As we look to mid-strip now, you can see Alderman still has the lead by a nose. Delco is closing, but the whole shot gave the win to Daryl Alderman. And there you can see the comparison of time. And it's all possible because the clock starts when the front wheels move, not when the light turns straight. Well, here is the pit area of Mike Dunn, the defending championship crew, hoping to take their driver to back-to-back -back U.S. national titles. Well, they'll meet the quickest of them all, though, in the semis. Mark Oswald. We'll be back to the NHRA U.S. national. Annapolis Raceway Park. I'm Paul Page with Steve Evans and John Garlitz, and the crowd is loving the action here. But back in the hot pits, it's all work for Johnny West crew as they prepare his funny car to meet Kenny Bernstein's in the semi-final round. They have plenty of work ahead of them. In the meantime, out on the drag strip itself, we are in second round action of Pro Stock. And we'll be seeing Warren Johnson in his Oldsmobile up against this man, Joe Clark from Virginia. Now, Johnson started the year with a big victory at the Winter Nationals. Ever since then, though, they have continued to beat up on the man, including Bob Glidden taking away his speed record here at the U.S. Nationals. Now, Joe Clark, his Camaro, was about a tenth of a second slower in round number one action than was Warren Johnson. So Clark uh, better be good off the starting line. Warren Johnson, well, this is a relatively new car. He's got to be pleased so far, though, with its performance. Here is W.J. Duluth, Georgia, a graduate engineer, a man who designs and builds his own cars and engines. There you can see that tachometer needle. Right now, it's at about 1,100. It will zoom to about 8,500 RPM, Don Garland. These cars have to leave it full throttle because they're not supercharged. They're normally aspirated engines. And there's a red light for Joe Clark. By that, we mean a foul start. He is automatically disqualified. He left too soon. There's four tenths of a second between that last yellow light on the tree and the green. If you try to over-anticipate, as Clark did, wanting a hole shot, and that front wheel moves out of the beam before the green light circuit is complete, it'll move right to red, and you see it there in the far lane. And of course, at the same time, Warren Johnson reacted and came off the line very early as well. 
So with Warren Johnson moving ahead to the semis and pro stock, here is Butch Leal. He will face Jerry Ekman. And it is Butch Leal who is trying to prevent Bob Glidden from winning his eighth Pro Stock World Championship. In fact, until a couple of races ago, Butch Leal had the points lead until Glidden suddenly got that Ford Thunderbird back on track. And I'll tell you, Jerry Ekman, Paul Page, what a season he's had. He broke that uh, long downspell for Chevrolet by winning the Summer Nationals, the first time Chevy had won in over a year. And it was Jerry Ekman of Ventura, California, who accomplished that. A fine driver in a very fast Chevrolet Camaro. He will face Butch Leal, who has already scored three race victories so far this year. Don Garlitz, pro stock takes a lot of time staging. That's correct, because they have to leave at such full throttle position. The engines are up high, and the guy that goes in first is at somewhat of a disadvantage because it's heating up his clutch, it's over revving the engine. They want to stage last with the best advantage. Well, this one is over really before it began. Jerry Eckman in the far lane, he did not win it as it appeared. He left a red light in his wake, another foul start. But Butch Lill outran him anyway, a 7.57 to a 760. So Jerry Eckman just rolled the dice and uh, gave up stake guys. Watch the Christmas tree in the car on the left side of the screen. The red light shows that Ekman moved first. Already, Butch Leal has won. Let's go to the far end, Steve Evans. Butch Leal climbing out of his Pontiac Transit. And Butch, did you see the red light oh, from I the competition? Oh, I red light. And my car rolled, and I put the clutch back in, and the light changed. Uh, I didn't see Jerry red light at all. I thought, I'm dead in the water here. Here I am, dead in the water. I thought he caught me. Uh, well, you're alive and well with a 757. Yeah, it was a decent run. I didn't know, I didn't realize he red lighted. I didn't see. I looked down at mine, I said, I had to be super late. And this is Jerry Ackman. Did you know you red lighted? No, I didn't. I saw the color and moved. I must have caught a real close one. You must have, but it caught you, actually, I mean, as it, it turns me, out. Apparently. I saw it and moved. I thought, I got a winner here. And this, Steve, let me tell you, this guy here has been running good all year long. He won English Town, and I'm very proud of him because he's from California, and, you know, I am too, and they've done a great job, and uh, hopefully they'll be with Pontiac next year. <laughs> well, the man in the blue suit moves on to the semis. And the mark of a pro, he wasn't distracted by what was going on on the other side of the race course. Back at the starting line, it is Bob Glidden on the near side looking for an unprecedented eighth U.S. Nationals title, and he faces Ken Koretsky. Kenny Koretsky, Paul, is in his first year of pro stock racing. That is the former Rear and Morrison Camaro, so we know he's got very strong wheels, also a Rear and Morrison motor. But Kenny has taken to driving these machines like a duck to water. They're maybe the most difficult car of them all in drag racing to drive. They're four-speed transmissions. You've got to do everything right. They leave very, very hard, set the driver back in the seat, just kind of roll his eyes back up. But you know, Bob Glidden has already had a tremendous weekend. Because two days ago, in the final of the Mr. Gasket Pro Stock Challenge, it was this man from Whiteland, Indiana, Bob Glidden, and his Ford Thunderbird, up against from Arlington, Texas, Bruce Allen in the Chevrolet Beretta. Did the fans love this one, Paul? It was Ford and Chevy side by side, the winner to receive $25,000. Now, Bruce Allen was looking for his third consecutive victory in this competition. It was Allen in the near lane, the Thunderbird of Glidden in the far lane. Allen was the last to stage, and that might have been an advantage. He was off the mark first. A sizable hole shot for the Chevrolet in the near lane, but look at the power of Bob Glidden. This was two days ago. Glidden won it at 745, 188 miles per hour to Allen 764. Well, the dominance of Bruce Allen and Chevrolet in the Mr. Gasket Pro Stock Challenge has come to an end at the hands of this man, Bob Glidden, and his Ford Thunderbird, a 745, but he gave you fits off the starting line again. It was a... Uh, he might have left on me a little, but I think he must have had a little track trouble uh we broke about 1100 foot i think you broke something yes and uh oh i think we won the race so you did indeed i can guarantee you that but was there a moment there when you had your doubts well it's hard to say you know i let the clutch out and uh out of the corner of my eye it seemed like bruce was ahead but uh by the second gear change you know his car faltered you know I i'm sure we we changed lanes because we thought the right lane might have a, a little problem 100 foot out so Apparently, we made the right choice for a change. And you know how much money you've just won? Absolutely. 25,000 big ones. And thanks to Joe Rutka and the people at the Performance Group. And uh, by gosh, uh, we're glad. We're happy. We, we appreciate it. And we're happy for you. Thanks, Joe. Bob Glidden, he won it. And one of the...
whatever Glidden broke then has certainly been repaired by now, and Glidden is as powerful as ever. Now he faces the challenge of Kenny Koretsky. Koretsky got to the second round of pro stock by beating Nick Nicolas. Now, though, he has to take on one of the toughest in the sport, without question, the toughest in the sport. And as Don Gallant pointed out earlier with Eric Reed, the funny car rookie, all the pressure really is on the man in the far lane. And Kenny Koretsky showing his inexperience. He was asleep at the switch. Bob Glidden with a monster full shot. And Glidden has an easy one here to go to the semis. Rusty, his son, likes it. A 747 to beat the 755. But with Koretsky being as late as he was, it looked worse than it should have been. So here's the semi-final round pairings. It will be the Ford of Glidden up against the Trans End of Butch Leal. Glidden will have the lane choice. The other half of the semis, the Olds of Warren Johnson against the Chevrolet of Daryl Alderman. And Johnson there has the lane choice. So second round completed in all categories now. We wait for the semi-finals. And back in the hot pits, Kenny Bernstein's crew working on his machine. He will meet Johnny West in the semis. And up just behind the starting line, Shirley Muldowney puts on her equipment, ready to face Joe Amato in the semifinal round of Top Fuel at the 33rd U.S. Nationals from Raceway Park. Today at Indianapolis Raceway Park for the 33rd U.S. Nationals. Paul Page along with Steve Evans and Don Garlitz. We're ready now for the semifinal rounds in Top Fuel. And there is Shirley Muldowney, ready to face Joe Amato, Don. This is the very best performance that I've seen out of Shirley in a number of years. That 528 earlier is really impressive. You know, Don, when you scored your first U.S. Nationals title back in 64, you were talking 1,200 or so horsepower. Now we're talking 3,000-plus horsepower. A lot of stress on the power train. Back at the first U.S. Nationals in 55, the dragsters all used early model Ford junkyard rear ends that they narrowed up at home. Investment, probably about $30. As the horsepower grew, they went to what's called a 9-inch Ford, and here's one of those housings already narrowed. And you know what? These are still plenty adequate in any of the gasoline-burning classes. But when it comes to the nitro cars, 3,000 horsepower, only a special-made custom unit will do. And this is the one from Strange Engineering. We have set the inspection cover aside so you can see that it is on the top of the housing for easy maintenance, and it's easy to change that ring gear in there for whatever ratio you want. Now, in there, you don't see spider gears or limited slip or positive traction. You don't need it. These are straight-line cars. What you will find is a live axle running through the unit. The axle is a billet chromoly steel, and it's all one piece splined where it runs through the ring gear. Now, over here under the inspection cover, you can see where the drive shaft connects to the pinion. It's very low in the car to keep the weight low in the automobile. Now, these are expensive. $3,750 without the brakes. But you only buy one, they're so durable. Ask Don Garlitz. He had the same rear end in both his top fuel racers that crashed at high speed. They are truly bulletproof. Don, I assume that you still believe in them. I certainly do. The one that was in the crash at Spokane is still alive and well. Now we're taking a look, Don Garlitz, at a run between Shirley Muldowney and Joe Amato. Shirley's not really in the points fight for the world championship, but Gwen LaHaye and Amato all are. She could be a spoiler. That's right, and she certainly has the ET to back it up. She could win this race easily, and Joe Amato knows this. There's really less pressure on Shirley Muldowney in this situation than there is Joe for those very reasons you guys just explained. Now, Amato has already turned on the pre-stage. Shirley Muldowney instantly moves up. She doesn't want to hold anybody up here. As we've said before, if you sit there too long, you can build more power than either of you need. Shirley Muldowney, she has run quicker at 5.28 than Amato. It is Amato away first. Shirley Muldowney, Joe Amato, what a great drag race on the big end. It is the muscle of Amato. Jerry Amato celebrating Joe's 5.32. Shirley Muldowney close at 5.40. So Joe Amato goes into his second NHRA U.S. Nationals final round. He was beaten in 1984 by Gary Beck. Who will he race? Will it be Daryl Gwynn? Here with a powerful, thundering burnout. Daryl Gwynn very intent on getting those tires good and hot and laying down some rubber on the track. Or will Joe Amato race Dick LaHaye, the man he is battling for for the world championship? Well, really both of these guys, but LaHaye is closer in the points. So while on one hand there is the U.S. Nationals title here on the line, it's also definitely a battle for the world championship. Now let's go down to the far end. Don Garlitz is with Joe Amato. Well, a real fine 532, Joe, 277. You're in the finals. Well, that's... That's all we started to do. You know, the speed, we'd like to get the 280, but we're kind of con concentrating on the world championship right now, Don, and winning the race here. And it's going to be interesting. I wish, you know, we're both 
kind of tough racer up there. I hope the La Heca get knocked out by Darrell, but it's going to be real close. So that's really what I'm going to hear. Well, I think that 532, that's going to be good. You know, the cars get tired toward the end of the day, and it's hot out here this afternoon. So that's a very respectful time. You, you could very well have lane choice. Well, the both of them ran a 30 in the heat a little while ago, and it's starting to cool off a little bit. But, Timmy, we burned a piston in the last run, so we had to do a little bit of adjusting on the fuel system. But they did a good job. And what did Shirley run? Shirley ran 540. 540, yeah. I knew she was going to be right there, so we just trying to step it up a little bit. We're just trying to be consistent and get to the final here. This is the U.S. Nationals. You bet. Good luck, Joe. Amato is still right, talking about the speed because if he can back up that 282, it's worth 200 bonus points towards our world championship. In the background, you can see Kim LaHaye looking over that car, making sure there's no leaks, anything wrong. And Don Garland's look at LaHaye. He's getting psyched up. You bet he is. He wants to beat that kid because he's got to hold him back. We got bonus points here at Indianapolis. That's right. It pays more than any other race. A good job here can go a long way. Don, put yourself in LaHaye's position. How would you have approached this race? Just exactly the way he's doing it. I, I would want to beat Daryl. But, you know, Daryl is, is not going to be psyched out. He's a very seasoned top fuel driver now. That's right. There were a few times a few years ago when you beat him, in fact, including right here at the U.S. Nationals, and maybe you could psych him a bit then. Yeah, I was just beating at the line. Uh, it was uh, experience was doing the job. Daryl is very experienced now. you got to outrun him. And look at this race. It is like, hey, he does outrun Daryl Gwynn. It will be Dick LaHaye and Joe Amato in the final. Wow, was this close. A 5.33 to a 5.39. One terrific race, though. Very, very close all the way down the strip. We take a look at it again, Don Garlitz. Yes, as you can see, the reaction times are almost identical as both cars leave the line just like they're tied together. But LaHaye's horsepower begins to pay off. And notice Daryl Gwynn moves over toward the center line just a little bit, gets out of the groove, and it costs him the race. So Dick LaHaye goes on to the win with a 5.33, and he will face Joe Amato in the final rounds. Amato, with his 5.32, will have the lane choice. Dick LaHaye has made his first ever U.S. Nationals final round, preventing Daryl Gwynn from being in his third final. A 5.33, you've lost lane choice. Well, we run 33 over there. Joe likes that lane. He'll probably go over there. I'm tickled to death to be put back in the left lane, which we'll wait and see what he does. You know, it's the U.S. Nationals when you see competition this keen. That was a horse race, and it's a pick'em final, really. Oh, it certainly is. It, uh, it's just, we'll go up there and race and hope for the best. <laughs> see you there. Thanks, Steve. And just another example of how important this event is to the drivers. The semifinal rounds and funny cars coming up at the U.S. Nationals. You've come to the right place. Indianapolis Raceway Park, the NHRA U.S. Nationals. We're in the semifinal round of funny car competition. It will be Kenny Bernstein up against Johnny West. And Don Garlitz, did you ever consider campaigning one of these cars instead of a fuel dragster? No, I never did. I've always liked the open cars, you know, where you can see the wheels and everything. I, I never liked it when they pull that body down. A little claustrophobic? I think so, and that also it's real fumey in there, and you get the feeling that maybe it could all just burst into flames at any time. Of course, it never does. Oh, no, I've never seen one of these burn to the ground. You know, Don, the funny car racers will tell you that they run their engines harder than you guys do in top fuel. Is that true? Not always. Uh, there are instances where they run them harder, but you can see by, like, that Daryl Gwen's fire earlier, uh, we run the cars pretty hard in top fuel. Of course, the funny car is carrying a couple of hundred pounds more weight. They don't have uh, the engine in the rear of the car for more traction. It, it takes a different approach. It's a totally different approach, and the tuner is a different deal. The, some of the things work uh, in top fuel. Some of Armstrong's tricks have worked on Daryl Gwen's car, but basically, it's a different approach. Don, how much of a psychological advantage does Bernstein have in this matchup? It's a tremendous psychological advantage because uh, Johnny West, on an even start here with Bernstein, cannot outrun him. The statistics will back me up on that. So he's got to get him out of the gate or Bernstein's got to do something wrong. And so that's really tough on him. So all the pressure with the man in the far lane, Johnny West, as he faces Kenny Bernstein. And West comes off the line first. West actually leaves ahead of Bernstein. They're running even halfway, but Kenny Bernstein pours on the power in the end. 
and Johnny West looked great, but still it was Kenny Bernstein with a 554 271. That's right. Johnny West fired his best shot. Good reaction time, good ET, but it just didn't come up to that massive horsepower. Watch closely here in this replay. You can see West is out front very decisively. Then here comes that Armstrong power. He's coming on down, and he powers right on by. So Kenny Bernstein takes the win and moves into the final round by beating Johnny West. Well, Kenny Bernstein will make a final round appearance due to a 554 last time. Smooth, clean, beautiful. Smooth on the outside and clean, but shook her hard on the inside, Steve. It lost some time in the tire shake, but we had to step on it to see if we can get it to go. Oswald's still out there ahead of us. Would you expect to meet Oswald in the final, the way things are going? Well, you never know. It's a tough day at the U.S. Nationals to get here is an honor to begin with. But you know that the two cars have been going hard all weekend since Thursday. They've been there. And they've been beating up on you. They're trying to take all your records away from you. Mike Dunn got speed. Oswald's trying to get ET. You'll be lucky to have your name in National Dragster if you don't win this. I agree with you, but all we care about is winning the U.S. Nationals and the Winston World Championship for the third time. Okay. So for Kenny Bernstein, one very important day. And in the finals, he will face one of two men, either Mark Oswald or Mike Dunn. Don Garlitz, both of whom have very impressive records here. Yes, they do. The 546 for Mark Oswald is just an unbelievable ET. And of course, the 278 miles an hour for Mike Dunn is just practically unbelievable. Well, you've got the fastest car meeting the quickest car. And Don, I want to put you on the spot. Who do you pick of these pair to race Kenny Bernstein? Well, I think it's going to be Mark Oswald because the only problem they had in the Big Bud shootout was a water line came loose. They have fixed that, and they have just been model consistency all day long. And I don't think that they're going to shake Oswald up. Okay, you heard it from Big Daddy. He picks the red car in the near lane, the Thunderbird body machine of Candies and Hughes, driven by Mark Oswald. In the far lane, sitting there calm, cool, and collected, it would appear, was Mike done a very smooth staging process. Oswald has lost traction. The car turns sideways. He's off the throttle. Mike Dunn wins it. Again, over 270 miles per hour. And as Dunn was pointed out earlier with Gary Ormsby, sometimes when you're the quickest car, you're also right on the edge of having just that happen. Not enough racetrack for the kind of power you're building. So Mike Dunn moves into the finals against Kenny Bernstein with a 563. Well, Oswald did a terrific job of gathering the car under him after coming off the line. He moved first, and then almost immediately the tires lost their traction. Now, Dunn lost traction as well, and then Oswald's car pitched sideways, and he had to drive it away from the barrier. So in the final round, it will be Kenny Bernstein facing Mike Dunn, and Bernstein will have the lane choice as he looks for a third world championship. Well, for the second year in a row, young Mike Dunn is in the final with a fine 572. Well, I like this race. This, uh, <laughs> this race has been pretty good to me the last couple of years. Uh, we uh, softened up a little bit for that run, and uh, it got down through there, but we're going to have to step her up a little bit for the final for the Bud King. Yeah, you, did you know that Oswald had smoked the tires? I figured he probably did because uh, he was out there a little bit off the, off the start, and then he disappeared, so I thought he might have you know, spun the tires or something happened to him. Well, I know you got a lot of work to do, so congratulations once again, Mike. Thank you, Don. And Mike Dunn knows if he's to have any chance against Kenny Bernstein, that crew has got to make that car leave the starting line just a bit harder. And for Kim LaHaye back in the pit area, I believe she's thinking, if I can just make my dad's car do exactly what it did the round before, we can beat Joe Amato. Stay with us at the NHRA U.S. Nationals. HRA U.S. Nationals. We're ready for the semi-final round in Pro Stock. I'm Paul Page with Steve Evans and Don Garlitz. And Don, as we watch Joe Amato's crew get ready for the finals, what are they thinking? What are they doing? Well, they're all just being real cool. Uh, Tim Richards is putting on some parts. This team is, uh, they're a very relaxed group. You don't see very much excitement over there. Each one is very meticulous in his work, though. Well, we're about to see some excitement as here comes the semifinals of Pro Stock, and this will be an Oldsmobile versus Chevrolet Camaro up here. And there is the Camaro of Daryl Alderman. Now, he is in the far lane. Warren Johnson put him there. Warren Johnson had lane choice based on the ET in the previous round. He has taken the near lane with his Oldsmobile Forenza. And Don, even though Daryl Alderman knows that Warren Johnson has the quicker car, Johnson knows that Alderman has just been knocking that tree down with hole shots throughout this event. That's how he got here. That's exactly right. 
the uh, the question here is going to be who gets off the line first. These cars are very evenly matched. Now, you mentioned before that sometimes with a pro stock, because of the way you have to bring the RPMs up, the staging last can be an advantage. Let's see what happens here. Who will go in, break first, and turn on both those little yellow lights on top of the tree? There's Warren Johnson, a little fidgeting around there, making sure uh, the car's in low gear, got a good grip on the wheel in the far lane is the Camaro. That is Daryl Alderman. And only one car will go to the final round. The other goes back in the trailer. They are both pre-staged. Nobody's moving, Don. No car wants to go in. They just want to sit there revving up their engine. The starter will get nervous. He'll want to force them in because nobody wants to give up that advantage of staging last. And these are not like the fuel cars. Though A little bit of heat build up here isn't going to hurt them. There's the starter indicating they better get in there. And they have the races on. Daryl Alderman just drilled Warren Johnson on the starting line. It is Daryl Alderman. A 7.59 beats a losing 7.53. Warren Johnson will be kicking himself. Well, Warren Johnson was totally asleep when the light came on. Alderman nailed the throttle and disappeared. So Alderman moves into the final round. And he will face the winner of this matchup between Bob Glidden and Butch Leal. Now remember Glidden working for an unprecedented eight U.S. Nationals victory. He certainly knows how to win this particular event. On the other hand, Butch Leal has never won here, so he certainly has a tremendous incentive to win. Let's go to Steve. Well, Daryl Alderman is slowly but surely, I think, stealing Butch Leal's title as the king of the whole shot in this class. You ran 59 to his 53. You got the light. Yeah, I just had the brakes, I guess, Steve. What was going on up there? Nobody seemed to want to stage. Well, uh, you know, you go up and you decide to stage first or stage last, and I'm sure Warren decided to do the same thing. So both guys wanting to stage last is what we're looking at. Yes. What breaks you? I don't know. <laughs> Buster Cow's the starter? Buster, yes. He, he, he can break you quick. Okay, very good job. Beautiful driving. Well, Wayne County prepared the car good. That's the main thing. It has been quick. Going into the final round, Darrell Alderman. Don Garlett said so many times before, the key in pro stock is whoever gets the hole shot, who gets away first. That's exactly right. You've got a whole field of 16 cars separated by a tenth of a second. It's a hole shot game. Well, Buster Cats is the chief starter at all these races. He can play those games, too. Sometimes if there's a long staging war, they'll move in. He'll give them a long light, and both drivers will sit there with those RPMs up, and uh, occasionally one will red light. So you take a chance of Buster uh, maybe uh, taking you on when you play those games. That's exactly right. The wrath of Buster counts the starter. So we'll see who wins this battle. Leo, Glidden, or the starter. Butch Leo, fantastic at leaving. Bob Glidden, incredibly consistent. Glidden in the near lane. Leo in the far lane as finally Glidden inches up. Immediately Leo comes as well. Leo pulls the front end off the ground while Glidden drifts over to the center line. They're even at the halfway point. Now Glidden pours on the power and Bob Glidden goes into the final round. Glidden with a 758, 188. Butch Leo with a 768-183. Don Garlis, good evenly matched race. Yes, it was. And Butch Leo, who usually gets the whole shot, didn't get it this time. Bob Glidden, up to a very fine performance, took off from the start and never gave an inch. But as they both left the line, Don, both of them were really out of control. Oh, yes. Bob Glidden moved almost on the center line. You can see the mark, so within about six inches. But he pulled it back into control and went on for the win. But once he got it pointed straight, he nailed the power, and Bob Glidden moved into the finals in a possible eighth U.S. Nationals victory. Glidden has the lane choice over Darrell Alderman by 1-100. Let's go to Steve Evans. Bob Glidden got out of the car saying, I took the wrong lane. What happened? Sure did. Well, we had a, a lot of wheel hop and spun, shook, got a little crossed up. I wasn't sure we didn't cross the center line at one point. Well, only by a hundredth or so do you have lane choice over your opponent in the final, Darrell Alderman. I, it surprises me that we'd even have lane choice, Steve, as the one we made. I don't know... Uh, 58, 758. 758, and, and I think Darrell went a 59. I... Mm-hmm. You watch those scoreboards, too. Well, uh, I'll tell you, the competition... You know how it is. Can you believe you're going into your 11th final round in a row consecutive here at Indy? Uh, I believe it. I know it. Uh, we we, we uh, work especially hard for this race, Steve. Where's this crowd behind you? Uh, uh, we've got great fans, especially here, but everywhere. Okay. Thanks a lot.
The amazing consistency of the man from Whiteland, Indiana, his shop not 20 miles from here as he goes into the final round. In the meantime, back in the pit area, Kenny Bernstein's crew, Dale Armstrong and the boys go to work on his machine as they prepare for their final round matchup with Mike Dunn. And we'll be back with the final rounds in a moment. Back at Indianapolis Raceway Park. This is Paul Page with Steve Evans and Don Garlitz for the NHRA U.S. Nationals. And there's trouble with Kenny Bernstein. Let's go to Steve Evans. There is a cavity between the frame rails of Kenny Bernstein's funny car. 40 minutes into what they thought was routine maintenance, a problem has been discovered with this engine. It's the idler in the gear drive at the front of the motor. They're having to change engines. Now, Dale Armstrong and crew do not believe in trying to use complete motors with blower injectors and fuel system. They prefer to strip all the parts, exterior parts, off the existing engine. Well, that takes an awful lot of time. They are really up against it here. Had they found this problem when they first got back to the pits, well, it wouldn't be that big a deal. It is a tremendous task for them to get a new motor in this car with the time available to them. If they pull this off, they are indeed the best in drag racing. There's definitely a full bore thrash underway in the Bernstein pit. In the meantime, it's the finals of Pro Stock. Bob Glidden ready to take on Daryl Alderman. But Don Garlitz, you've had exactly the same problem Bernstein has now. How much trouble is he in? He's in very serious trouble because they've got to get this race over with. They could run without Bernstein. That same problem put me out in Phoenix a couple of years ago. Well, in addition to the fact that the final is coming up in Funny Car, there is also the threat of rain. And NHRA will want to get this event completed before that rain hits Indianapolis Raceway Park. Back to this final round, Pro Stock. There is Daryl Alderman. He would love to see a victory light at the end of this run. In the near lane, Bob Glidden looking for an eighth world championship, looking for an eighth U.S. Nationals title. Don, are we looking at another staging battle here? We could well be because uh, Daryl Alderman, he's got nothing to lose. Glidden is the fastest car, the quickest car in this race, so he wants to do everything that he can to put the hurt on him. Of course, Bob Glidden has been in this position so many times before. Does it maybe not affect him at all? I don't think it does. I think Bob is extra cool. They come off the line even. Glidden on the near side. Alderman the far side. They're even at the halfway point. Now Glidden pulls ahead and edges him out at the line. Bob Glidden has done it. An eighth U.S. Nationals title for Bob Glidden. Look at Edda and the crew. Boy, are they happy with that one. Bob Glidden with a 743-188 to Alderman's losing 752-189. Big Daddy, let's look at it again. And we can see Daryl Alderman made a fine move off the starting line, but Bob Glidden had the tremendous power of that Thunderbird, and he passed him just shortly out, out about 300 feet and went on down to victory. Well, with the Glidden's, it's a family affair of racing. Wife Etta, sons Rusty and Billy, they all work together on the car, and of course, they win together. Let's go to the far end, and Steve Evans. Well, Darrell Alderman gave it everything he had, but the Chevrolet was no match for this Thunderbird. Bob Glidden, that's eight U.S. Nationals titles. That's right, Steve. The Thunderbird was thundering today, for sure. I'll tell you. I know how I feel. Ed and the kids have got to feel great right now. Darrell did give us a good race until I feel neck to neck till half track. Uh, damn, I'm, I'm telling you. This was a little tougher race for you than it might have looked like from the grandstand. Well, yes. Uh, the prior round, we had wheel hop really bad got crossed up, nearly hit Butch. Uh, we had no idea what was going to happen. We kind of threw the dice. We, we told Darrell we were going to take the right lane, and then, well, we decided we'd take the left lane, so I guess the boys made the right decision again. Terrific job. Congratulations. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Don? Nothing to be ashamed of. You didn't win, but you certainly made a fine showing. Yeah, well, we're, we're proud of it. Wayne County's worked hard to get this car down the track and make power, and I'm just tickled for them. Well, there's got to be winners and losers, but uh, today you're a winner. Yeah, I feel like we are. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, Daryl can be proud. He was a worthy opponent, but the win went to Bob Glidden. Who will win in Funny Car? They've got the blower back on in Kenny Bernstein's pit area, but obviously they are still thrashing. And the call has gone out to bring the cars to the line. This is in Kenny Bernstein's pit area, where they have just fired the engine. Now, they're running a test to make sure that this engine is ready to go, but we're ready for top fuel. For the past three years, it's been this man, Don Garlitz, whom I've interviewed as the winner of top fuel. Big Daddy, 
Who do you think we'll interview this time? Well, I kind of think you're going to interview Joe Amato. Uh, LaHaye is pretty cagey, but he ran a hundredth slower than uh, Joe did. And I think that Joe will step his car up just a little bit. I'm a little afraid that uh, Dick is going to smoke the tires trying to make a better, quicker ET. Well, you know, this is a tremendous break in the 33-year tradition of the U.S. Nationals. Normally, top fuel would be the final round. But apparently, they've decided to give Kenny Bernstein an extra few minutes. We're threatened by weather now, the possibility of rain. So we're going to roll with the final round of top fuel before Funny Car. And you're watching as Dick LaHaye and Joe Amato move to the line. And let's point out that running top fuel first in no way inconvenience these two drivers. They were in the lanes pacing around nervously. They want to get this one over with. It's the biggest of the year for both of them. One tremendous confrontation between two men. This man, Joe Amato, and Dick LaHaye, they have been locked in battle throughout the entire season. And neither of these two men has ever won the U.S. Nationals. What would it mean to Joe Amato to win his first ever U.S. Nationals in top fuel? Well, Steve, to win the Nationals, the big one of all time, and hopefully set the speed record and back it up in the final, that'll be a, a storybook ending and a dream come true. I don't know if I could take it. it it's probably the most important race of my whole career. It, uh, you know, this is the grandfather of all drag racing, and it's the biggest drag race of the year. And uh, to win this would just be astounding. I mean, I, I would probably be lost for words, to be truthful with you, and we'll have to wait and see what happens at the other end. Well, there you have Dick LaHaye's indication of just how important this event is. Don Garlitz, it really is special for these top fuel drivers especially. I can vouch for that personally. I've been in this position eight times, and uh, it's, it's just great. You, it, it's a Cinderella story, storybook ending. They both were telling it like it was. How much additional pressure because of the event itself? Like, well, you could see when the, the shot of Dick earlier with his hands, he was just gripping his hands together in the cockpit. He was just trying to calm himself for this event. So it's Dick LaHaye in the near lane, Joe Amato in the far lane. Both begin to inch up now into the staging lights, the final round, top fuel eliminator, the 33rd U.S. Nationals. Both of them move forward ever so slowly. The light goes green. They come off the line fairly even. LaHaye wavers the front end just a bit, but Amato takes it all the way for the win. Joe Amato with a 5.26-279 to a losing 5.25-274. And Joe Amato wins his first U.S. Nationals. Don, let's look at it again. Paul, oh, we've been talking about reaction time this entire race. You're going to see right there, Joe wins the race by leaving first. LaHaye actually had a better ET and should have won, but Joe, by virtue of that leave, has won the race. Joe Amato had the best leave of any driver in top fuel. The driver won this one. He ran a hundredth quicker and you beat him. Oh, well, Steve told me it was going to hurt Steve. I'll be okay, Steve. That's okay. I'm not excited or nothing. God, the U.S. Nationals. <laughs> Tim told me it was going to be real tight, he said, but you're going to have to weld them to the tree. You know, we've been driving real good all day, and I've been just concentrating a real lot on the tree. And I've been getting real good lights, and, you know, I've gotten my eyes picked out the last race, so I came here with the idea that I knew I was going to have to do real good, and, and thank God they gave me enough power to do it. You know, nothing I could tell you would spoil this moment, but you've missed the record by a tenth of a mile an hour. God, Steve, I wish we polished the car before. <laughs> a tenth. Well, that's okay. We'll, we'll get it at the motorplex. I'm not, you know, wanted to win the Nationals. We wanted to get the points lead. You know, we want to do good for our sponsors, TRW, Mr. Gasket, Hurst. You know, there's a lot of people here. The U.S. Nationals, you know, the winter time, everybody remembers who won the U.S. Nationals. That's right. You know, the World Championship, this helps us on the points, too. So, uh, you know, Tim Richards and my wife and the crew, they did an outstanding job. No one who saw it will ever forget 282 miles an hour. Thank you for that. And we'll be back with the 282. Man, we didn't back the record up, but it'll happen before the year's out. Joe Amato, what a happy man. Amato trying to back the record up, that is run within 1% of that 282, so it would go into the books as an official record. But Joe Amato, nonetheless, is the U.S. Nationals top fuel champion. There, the congratulations from Dick LaHaye. You have no idea what it's like to, to be in Amato's shoes right now. It's one of the most fantastic feelings in the world to win the U.S. Nationals. I mean, you just, you're just bubbling over with joy, and you can't get to your crew chief, your wife, fast enough, your crew members. It's just a wonderful feeling. One man yet to feel that kind of joy. Will it be Mike Dunn or Kenny Bernstein?
Well, Paul, both drivers know what that feeling is like. Mike Dunn, of course, won it last year, looking to make it two in a row. And back in 1983, it was Bernstein winning both the Big Bud Sheriff and the U.S. Nationals title. Right now in that starting line is a nervous crew for Kenny Bernstein, Don Garlick, wondering if there's anything that's going to go wrong. Remember, that engine was built in a matter of moments. Let me tell you, that crew isn't the only one that's nervous. Kenny Bernstein is plenty nervous right now. He's inside that thing. If one hose or one bolt has been left loose, he could be a dead man if the sequence was wrong. So he's thinking about it. Did everybody do their job under that tremendous pressure that they were under correctly? And the challenge to the crew of the Joe Paisano oil machine was to get that car to leave the starting line. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. That's the only weak link in that car. The speed indicated it's got all the power it needs. That's exactly right. They have got to get it off the line, and they've got to get it off the line first because they have not been getting the good ETs that Kenny Bernstein has been getting all day long. Bernstein the near lane. Mike Dunn the far lane. Bernstein's engine only has the last five seconds, but will it hold? Dunn's traction goes up in smoke, and Kenny Bernstein has done it. Kenny Bernstein wins Funny Car for the U.S. Nationals, and with it, the World Championship. Look at the celebration around with Kenny Bernstein's crew. They congratulate Dale Armstrong. They should congratulate themselves. They got the engine working. And as you can see, there they stepped up Mike Dunn's car just a little too much. It smokes the tires and leans out. Well, Bernstein's car powers on down the track to victory. And proving once again in racing that no one ever does it alone. The crew made a difference. There's not another crew in drag racing that could have put this man on the starting line with the troubles between rounds. Can you believe you're even here? No, it's hard. And you said it. The crew, Dale Armstrong, Mike Wood. Jim Mayo, Charlie Nielsen, and Daryl Gwynn's crew, and all our friends. The Tom McKeelan was in there. My goose, the Coors goose come in there and helped everybody. We couldn't do it without them, I'll tell you. And Budweiser, Quaker State, and Buick. And a 553. I mean, they just came right back with a bare, short block motor. Well, they did. Dale does it that way. That's the way he has them prepared because he changes the combination so much. But you never worry if you don't run out of time. But they put on the kangaroo shoes and ran hard on that one, Steve. Indeed. Kenny Bernstein, U.S. Nationals champion again. Oh, it's, great. it's a great one, I'll tell you. There's nothing better than the U.S. Nationals. Nothing. That says it all. So congratulations to our new champions, Kenny Bernstein, Joe Amato, and Bob Glidden. And a special thanks to that grand champion, Don Garlitz, for being part of our crew here today. Paul Page for Steve Evans, so long from Indianapolis. The executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is Harvey M. Palish. Produced and directed by John B. Mullen. Promotional consideration provided for and a fee paid by the Style Auto World Championship Team, the nation's premier source of fast lane fashions. Style Auto, the champion's choice for the style of your life.